So th th this is just basically, it's a slideshow kind of backing up what I'm going to be, be talking about. Really what we're all talking about, we, we're looking to carry a firearm. Most of us already carry a firearm, have carried a firearm for years, and we want to find out, is it going to work, right? How is it going to work? How well is it going to work? Right off the bat, there are two reactions that human beings exhibit when they're being shot. It's a psychological reaction, and then there's a physiological reaction, right? You see people who get shot in the pinky and they fall down, oh my God, I've been shot, it hurts so bad, I'm done. That's a psychological reaction, right? We've all been taught and brainwashed, it's supposed to hurt when we get shot. So our brain reacts with, holy shit, I just got shot, this is going to hurt, I've got to lay down, right? That happens. Apart from that, if that does not happen, the physio physiological way of disabling a human organism is much more complicated than, <clears throat> than Hollywood likes us to believe, excuse me. Um, as far as handgun projectiles go, with the energy levels available to us in handguns, there really are only two effective ways of disabling a human organism. And the way to do that is, number one, the so-called CNS shot, central nervous system, right? Brain box, spinal cord. Um, very small target, very hard to hit. Our opponent is moving, most likely. We're shooting on the defensive. We rarely take the offensive, hopefully not. So it's a, it's a small target. It's hard to hit. Evolution has armored that target very well. Right? Upper jaws, teeth, cheekbones, eyebrows are all materials that are very hard in nature and can very easily redirect a projectile or even stop a projectile. The only other way, exsanguination. It's a fancy word for bleed out. Right? In other words, when blood pressure drops, we've leaked out enough blood, blood pressure drops, shock sets in, I don't feel so good, the world starts spinning, my knees get weak, I don't want to fight anymore. Goal achieved. The downside of that, exsanguination takes time. How long does exsanguination takes? take? It depends. Depends what we hit. Right? It, it, it depends how big the hole is. It depends how much air gets out, how much, how much air gets in, how much blood gets out. But most of all, it depends, did we reach a vital organ? Other than rifles, which are a separate topic, the only way we can damage or destroy a vital organ with a handgun bullet is to reach that vital organ with a handgun bullet. And stop a minute and think about that. Right? If you're launching a bullet at me, center of mass, it's perfectly on path to, to reach the heart, let's just say. Let's just pick an organ. And that bullet does not reach the heart. Am I going to change my behavior immediately? Maybe not. Right? Whereas if you reach the heart, you have a cardiac bleed, and things start going downhill for me pretty quick. So if you go back to the FBI wound ballistic protocol, which is really what we're talking about here today, right? the wound ballistic protocol is what we design our ammunition to. It was learned the hard way back you can see the date up there, April 11th, 86, where two combat-hardened individuals had uh, developed a habit of taking down armored cars, leaving no living witnesses behind. They were finally caught up with and stopped in a sting operation by the FBI. A pit maneuver stopped the car, and the first shot in that famous gunfight was delivered center of mass, exactly what we trained to. Mr. Michael Platt was hit center of mass. A bullet entered the biceps, exited the biceps, entered the right thoracic cavity, went center of mass, and stopped two inches shy of the heart. This was a non-survivable wound. Right? No amount of blood transfusions would have kept this man alive indefinitely. However, this man, mortally wounded, exited the sunroof of his vehicle, got his converted Ruger Mini-14, killed multiple FBI agents, crippled others. The whole thing was finally stopped by the heroic action of Special Agent Eddie Mireles who with one arm shot useless, hand cycled his 870 till that ran out, and then finished it with contact shots with a revolver. So the dust settles, the bodies are in the bag, and FBI says, what happened? We just went to the semi-automatic pistol away from the revolver. We selected the bullet that we think is the most effective. And the attributes the FBI was looking for back then in a program called the RII, the Relative Incapacitation Index, was a bullet that arrives at extremely high speed, because the belief was, the faster the bullet hits, the more violent that temporary cavity is when we get struck. Therefore, we do more damage. And then we want that bullet to break up and inflict multiple wound channels. That bullet, a Winchester 115 grain plus P plus LE only, did exactly that. All right, the bullet hit, broke up, and stopped shy of the heart. Would this individual have stopped his hostile action sooner had the bullet gone deeper and reached the heart? One can only surmise, but it's pretty safe to say if, if there's a hole in the heart, things stop pretty quick. So that being said, as feeble as handgun bullets are, and they really are feeble on human beings, right? When November comes and we start looking for that white-tailed deer out there, we bring our 270, our 30 out 6 our 300 win, and all of those have more energy at 500 yards than our handguns have at the muzzle. But when we confront the world's most dangerous predator, 
we bring our pop gun. Why? It happens to be there when we have it, right? That's, that's the purpose of the handgun. And I'm not saying that to, array, to erode the confidence in your sidearm, but Hollywood has, again, taught us to believe we shoot somebody and they fall over, they quit. If you look at surveillance pictures, once in a while you'll see them, you know, uh, stop and rob Kmart, whatever they're called, gas station, et cetera, et cetera. You see people soaking up bullets and continuing to fight. And that is, handgun bullets all have that in common. They have a certain energy level that, that is way be below what a rifle is, right? If you take a handgun bullet, you pick your favorite caliber. 40 cal, 357 SIG, 357 Magnum, 45 Auto. They all fall to 45 Ball, there's one. Again, I'm, I'm not being disparaging. But in the end, all these bullets do one thing. They inflict a temporary cavity when that projectile hits us. We're made up largely of water, right? Water is a non-compressible substance. We blow up for about a nanosecond, yet we're elastic. We come back together. We recover from that. And all that's left is the permanent wound cavity, the actual crushing path that that projectile took through our body. That temporary cavity, that brief blow up, it's going to cause one hell of a bruise down the road, without a doubt. But it's not going to change our behavior at this moment in time, all right? Once you cross a certain velocity boundary, 2,200 feet a second is that number, our tissue in, during the course of temporary cavity cannot contain that expansion anymore and it begins tearing. So that's why people hit center punch with a rifle usually don't carry on a whole lot more hostilities. When human tissue has to expand at, vo at velocities incoming greater than 2,200 feet a second, we start laterally tearing. Our temporary cavity becomes a permanent wound cavity. Much more damage. Let's talk about knockdown power. We all are familiar with Newton's law of physics, right? First law of physics. For every forward force, there is a corresponding rearward force. So if this gentleman launched a bullet that would knock me on my ass, what should happen to him? When was the last time we got knocked on our ass by a handgun? Right? To define it even better, if you take a 124 grain projectile arriving at 1,280 feet a second. That is our M9 NATO ball military issue round right now, right, in the military. That bullet has some knockdown power. That knockdown power, also referred to as momentum transfer, is equal to a 10-pound weight dropping from 0.72 inches. So all these articles we've written about knockdown power. Baloney, right? I intend to prove that when we step on the range. We're going to shoot 9, 40, 45. We're going to pull the bullets out. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about the bullets, why they're constructed the way they are. But the most important takeaway for you should be, and I think that's how it's going to turn out, always does, is you're going to say, as I rotate that block around, damn, the wounds are all the same. Yep. Because handguns all suck. Right? Short of a hand grenade, there's not much more you can do. Right? So that being said, what does a bullet have to do to bring our chances up when we do use that pop gun I just described to save our life or defend our loved ones. We have to reach a vital organ, right? As the FBI learned the hard way in, in, in Miami, if you don't reach a vital organ, that vital organ is not going to bleed, you're not going to wreck that vital organ. So as afraid as we are of overpenetration, we have to have adequate penetration to reach a vital organ. So what is that? Matter of interpretation. Right. You talk to the FBI in 1987 when they developed a wound ballistic protocol, they said we want 10 to 12 inches. Not more, not less. So for that being said, we have to get into the upper thorax. This is a human torso, right, looking down on the top, pectorals, biceps, triceps. This is just to show you the average width of the torso and the different paths of penetration a bullet might have to take depending from where you engage your opponent. The problem is you can't choose your angle of engagement. Remember, you're again not on the offensive, you're on the defensive, right? I'm not that thick. If I'm engaging you front on, six inches of bullet penetration will probably stop me. So the number that we design our projectiles to is right around the 14 inch mark. All right, the modern FBI protocol now says 12 to 18, and please, no less than 12. So as you can see, the numbers have gotten bigger and bigger. We Americans are getting bigger and bigger, that's one reason. But the other one is we're no longer as horribly afraid of overpenetration as we once were. We're starting to understand overpenetration, right? If Ron shoots me now and his bullet courses through me sideways, does its job to stop me, and then hits that screen leaving a bloody smear, I would argue to say that is pretty good overpenetration. In other words, the projectile did not have a lot lethal energy left. It has done its job inside the target. So 
what really I would like you to look for as, w as we walk out there and we walk up to that gel block after being shot, your first question should be, how deep did they go? And my gel blocks are 12 inches long. Why? Because that's where the sweet zone is. Right? Ideally, these bullets being shot should end up in that sweet spot, 12 to 14 inches. At the end of the first block, entering the second block. That tells us we're able to reach the upper thorax pretty much on anybody we have to engage, maybe short of Brock Lesnar or someone like that. That makes sense? Here are some of the average penetrations listed that you'll see on heavy clothing. And th that's what you'll see on some of our websites. There's a website out there, le.vistaoutdoor.com. It's a huge portal for law enforcement. And you look into wound ballistics as an example, you will see data derived from live shoots as we're doing today. And you can see, for example, well, that Johan character was talking about that 9 millimeter bullet. How deep does it go on average? He showed me 14 inches on that day in March, but what does it do year in, year out? You can look it up on that website. There are three fields of ballistics research, by the way. Internal ballistics, what happens in your gun. Ignition, extraction, ejection, et cetera, et cetera, right? Inter external ballistics is what happens to your projectile en route to its intended zip code. Gravity, atmospherics, wind, in intervening barriers, so on and so forth. Terminal ballistics, also known as wound ballistics, is the sole focus of today. What must that bullet do when it hits its intended target? Okay. So all, all this talking really is me trying to bring you to the consensus that first and foremost, as feeble as our handguns are, regardless what handgun and caliber we're carrying, First and foremost, we got to get to a vital organ. We got to have adequate penetration. Once we have that, then comes the second benefit, right? Thankfully, we're not in the military. We can shoot hollow points. We want that bullet to grow on impact. That's why we sell hollow points, right? That bullet hits. The way a hollow point works is you have a big cavity in the nose. That cavity fills up with body tissue. Body tissue is largely made up of water, again, a non-compressible substance. That water has got to go somewhere as this bullet is screaming through us. We have serrations, also known as skiving, cut into the jacket and the core material, which weakens the bullet in certain places, thereby cracking that lethal flower open. And we maximize the wound cavity. The bigger the bullet, the better statistical chance we have of tearing off a blood vessel, doing organic damage, et cetera, et cetera, right? And just as important, the bigger the bullet, the greater the cross-section, that bullet stops on time. Hence the hollow point, right? So we want adequate penetration. We want expansion at least one and a half times original caliber. That makes sense? And, the first and then last, unlike what the FBI thought originally, we want that bullet to hold together. Right? We, the more weight we have, the more momentum we have. If we have lots of momentum, we have penetration. So if that bullet breaks up on impact, causing multiple wound channels, and none of them go deep enough, we've created one heck of a surface wound that'll create one heck of a scar six weeks from now, but we're not stopping our opponent at this little moment in time that really matters to us because we're fighting for our life. What we'll do today when we shoot on the range, the first series of shots will be bare gelatin. In other words, naked dude at 10 feet out. So this is the, the best scenario to set a bar, right? Naked dude 10 feet out. We don't want that bullet to overpenetrate. We want to see what the bullet does on a soft target. Next shot will be four layers of denim. That was the old heavy clothing protocol four layers of 12 ounce cotton duck. So that's, that's like your black Carhartt jacket, very heavy stuff. You, let's see if the bullets open up, All right? Next one will be two layers of sheetrock wallboard, which is most of our houses have their walls built that way. But I very quickly want to get to the toughest one of all of those, which is laminated auto glass, windshield glass. Windshield glass, two layers of laminated glass at an angle offset has a huge tendency to cut bullets apart. You take a subpar bullet, gets cut apart, which means the penetration in the body behind the glass is going to be subpar. You, again, want to have a significant depth to disable the driver. See you gentlemen in the range.